violation of law. Fifty percent of Americans favor quarantine of AIDS patients. Fifteen percent feel they should be tattooed. Surrender yourself, zero, no contact, no food, nothing, to see here, move, along now, move, move, now. On the move, the government's Operation Zero releases V.007 Agent Zero today. Hundreds of Zero Gen are arrested in the cities. The government urges Zero Gen to come forward and admit themselves to the ICU. Intensive Care Unit for Sexual Reassignment. The government stresses the upgraded V.007 Agent Zero is immune to viral fluid, while warns Zero Gen to refrain from any fluid contact with Agent Zero. Surrender yourself, Zero. Yeah, applause maybe for them. Yeah. Um, I didn't mention the title of this, but I think it, it's uh, even better to mention it after what's in the flesh, the other body in queer cinema. It's a brilliant idea to put these two filmmakers together, I think, because both of them created fantasies beyond sort of like the norm of any sort of body. Um, Eduardo Casanova by creating his own sort of like deformed or other bodies and Chuli Chang, of course, um, with her cyborg um, fantasy or utopia or dystopia. And I'm already stuttering in the sense of how to describe this film because it is very difficult to describe. And so, uh, Julie, because you already made another film that uh, sort of like was very sexual, very body oriented, and that already played with a um, science fiction version of uh, a cyborg sexuality, maybe you can tell us about your universe and what led you to, to make Fluid Zero. Uh, the the uh, the film Toby is mentioned is called uh, the film I made before called uh, IKU, which is produced uh, by uh, Uplink in Japan, and uh, it kind of became it was premiered at Sundance in 2000, and kind of became a kind of uh, cyberpunk cult film. 
And uh, that film was actually a takeoff of Blade Runner. And so I think I, I just have a, a bit of this obsession about the cyborg and sex, you know, because I think in, uh, in the Blade Runner, there is, seems to be so much uh, sex tension between uh, the Shang Yang character and uh, Harrison Ford character, uh, Rachel and um, uh, Rachel. So anyway, so um, you know, I, I really been following that thread about the sexuality for the android. You know, so that that's really basically. As for the Fui Zero, was uh, it was actually written uh, right after I made IKU in two thousand, and uh, I was invited to show the film at uh, Denmark in the Copenhagen Festival. Uh, at that time, I went to visit the last Von Trier's, uh, company, and they invited me to... Zentropa? Yeah, Zentropa. I visited the studio, and at that time, they were really launching this uh, particular division called Pussy Power. And so they invited me to write a scenario, a concept, and I wrote for it. And uh, anyway, in two years' time, that particular division went bankrupt, and so I never got to make the film. Um, I start using the concept for Fuit uh, to make some art project installation, um, but it really took me 17 years to uh, realize the film until I find my uh, German producer, Jürgen Bruning, in Berlin three years ago, and we worked on it for the past three years. Um, Fuit Zero actually oriented from uh, my own sort of lament of a certain uh, sad feeling since uh, you know the AIDS uh, epi academ um, epidemic, uh, particularly at the time of the 80s, I was living in New York City, and many of my friends died of the AIDS. And uh, you know, I always think, think that I just carry this AIDS virus with me. You know, I carry the AIDS virus with me. Um, so basically, uh, I, I I mean it virtually, I guess. <laughs> And uh, basically the film set the scenario of how the AIDS virus got mutated in the future. And so the, the people sort of through the generation, we all know about this kind of cross-generation mutation. So the virus actually got mutated into a drug. So uh, the drug actually came from the body fluid. So it's actually through the ejaculation of body fluid this including the sperm, the female ejaculation, the piss, and all that. And so this particular drug become, uh, uh, this particular mutated virus became a drug that replaced the white powder of the 20th century, you know. So this became like a 21st century new drug. It still gives you a kind of sensational, uh, sort of sec more like sen sexual sensational um, high. Uh, a kind of viral high, fluid high. So basically the film started with this and then it involved the, the drug law, the, the government, the pharmaceutical, all tried to get hold of, you know, put their hands on this particular drugs. And it's really interesting, you already mentioned the, um, the production of that uh, fluid. Um, there, are, there, are, there are many scenes of the film starts with um, uh, a couple of uh, guys who masturbate constantly, who constantly have to produce sperm. There are seven. There are seven? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot to mention it's seven. Um, and uh, it's really interesting what you do with a body that uh, the body in, in this film almost like um, uh, in those dystopian science fiction films where uh, organs are harvested, sort of like they their bodies have become just a production machine for mm -hmm. that certain fluid, and maybe we can actually look at that scene. It's a little warning that it's sexually explicit, but I think everyone is used to that at Panorama anyways. <laughs> okay. Do you want to set up the scene? No. no, no. no. This is a, it's a, at, a, at a, a place called Urinal, like U for Urinal. And uh, Diva is the drug lord who controls seven men. Um, yeah, so um, I just want to say I also have like female ejaculation scene. Uh, I also have female ejaculation scene, but I always find like that is probably even harder for people to take it. So we're just gonna see male ejaculation now.
leave it at this uh, image. Um, the sperm and piss and everything as a drug, and it's so fascinating to watch your film and see that you never know when the reality of real fluid starts and when the virtual reality of your virtually animated piss fountains, cum fountains, and all sorts of fountains um, uh, sort of uh, make their way into the film. And uh, when, when also the film leaves the story and it's just about bodily fluids more or less, and we, we're sort of like in a zombie utopia or dystopia where the which way you would like to read it. Maybe tell us a little bit about, I mean, you talked about the fluid in itself before, and I think the associations with HIV, um, and the fact that people constantly have to cover or uh, digest or inject sort of like bodily fluids that we know can carry certain viruses is even sometimes uh, uncomfortable to watch, and maybe you can tell us a little bit about that provocation. Uh, basically, I think, you know, since the, the AIDS uh, crisis epidemic, uh, we are, we are uh, advised uh, or we, we got used to, you know, not to exchange body food. You know, the body food is the, a taboo for any uh, exchange. And uh, so in the film, the fantasy is actually to go back to a time of... Uh, free exchange of body fluids and I think the end of the film I, I say liberate the fluids. So there is a, a kind of joy liberation of letting your fluid go, uh, including um, I, I have a couple hackers who actually uh, doing a lot of pissing, and, but their pissing is actually a way of coding, uh, coding to try to change their body DNA, uh, DNA code. And, uh, in this way, I also want to, you know, speaking of the body fluid and pissing, sexing, I, I do owe uh, Samuel R. Delaney, a science fiction writer, uh, a gratitude, I think, uh, uh, for all my work at the moment in this kind of uh, fluid work. I, I really indebted to his work, yeah. yeah. For the first round, leave it here, and then I go over to Eduardo. Oops. And because I talked about the universes that you both create, and it's really fascinating how these two films um, correspond with each other. And a very different, but uh, also kind of uh, um, comparable approach that you do with creating a very um, unique, sometimes irritating, sometimes provoking um, universe of people um, who have non-normal bodies, some of them naturally not normative, others um, drastically created by you, as we see here. Um, the woman who doesn't have eyes but has diamonds in her eyes. We have um, the other woman that has already been in a um, short film by Eduardo Casanova who has an asshole where the mouth is and a mouth where her ass is. We have the character of the man who wants to be a mermaid and then we have very short people, very big people and so on. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about the creation of this universe which goes back to a lot of other like photographic works and film works, yeah. <coughs> eh, hola, hola a todos. Eh, bueno, eh, este universo nace de la necesidad de, de meter cosas eh, completamente horribles, como puede ser el, la pedofilia, el asesinato, eh, las ganas de morir, envolverlas en un, en un espacio rosa, ¿no? Hay, hay algo que a mí me obsesiona y es lo, lo, lo que se esconde detrás de lo bonito, lo que se esconde detrás de lo precioso, eh, que me parece muy, muy perturbador. Yes, hello everybody. Um, I think uh, this film, this universe that you see uh, on screen really um, has its origin in the, the requirement and the necessity really to uh, uh, turn towards thing, things that are really horrible at first sight, for example, like pedophilia or uh, assassination, killing somebody, or even the wish to die at, at some moment as well. And I try to take these things that are very difficult and put them into a, a rose-tinted, a rose-colored universe. And I think it's really trying to look behind the surface, uh, the aesthetic appearance of things, the things that might look nice or uh, pleasing, to look, pleasing to look at, and that are actually quite difficult to take. Sí, también creo que, que el, el, la utilización del color rosa para generar este universo que puede parecer naif o, o candy, eh, también es por, por todo lo que genera el, el color rosa. El color rosa siempre ha sido un color que se ha, que se ha unido a, o a la feminidad o al colectivo gay, ¿no? y me parece que el, que el color eh, 
como muchas otras cosas, no debe ser monopolio de nada. Por eso, eh, por eso insisto con el color rosa eh, envolviendo cosas que no, que no son precisamente naif. Yes, and I also believe that the color rose, uh, the rose color in this film is really uh, very, very um, important because uh, usually it is associated with things that might seem uh, naive or candy-like at, at first sight. And traditionally also, the rose color stands for everything which is the u pertaining to the universe, uh, to the female universe or the gay universe. And uh, I, write, uh, I believe, on the contrary, that no color should be uh, limited or categorized like that. Uh, there shouldn't be any monopoly on that co color, and therefore I felt that uh, I wanted to take uh, color and uh, use it in order to show things that are not that nice. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about the creation of, um, of these characters. Um, what I found fascinating and also a little bit provoking, but not in a negative way, is that um, some of the bodies are natural, other bodies, and some of the bodies are the bodies that you created. And I wonder what you can say about that. First of all, how you got the idea to have the woman without the eyes, the uh, woman with the asshole as a mouth, and also putting them together with real other bodies. Bueno, lo primero que tengo que decir es que eh, ha sido muy difícil encontrar a gente, a gente con eh, malformaciones físicas, ha sido muy difícil encontrar eh, actores eh, así, porque la industria eh, no, genera, no genera gente malformada. Eh, la, la industria solo apuesta por, por unos cánones de belleza establecidos que a mí me cabrean mucho y que no me gustan, y de ahí nace la necesidad de crear eh, estos personajes. Y ahora continúo. Well, first thing, uh, the first thing I have to say is that it's very, very difficult to find people with deformities like that, actors that can be, could be used in a film like this, because uh, the film industry as such uh, does not provide for that kind of actor at all. It's uh, very much normed, it's very much, uh, uh, or hues very much to a kind of standard that uh, I really didn't like at all, it didn't appeal to me, and therefore I had to create these uh, shapes as well. Por eso me empeñé en, en encontrar lo primero los, la, 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 el mayor, la mayor cantidad de, de, de gente que, que era así, malformada de nacimiento, y luego eh, transformar a actrices que en España son muy guapas eh, y son casi iconos adolescentes, como puede ser Ana Polvorosa, y transformarlas en, en mujeres eh, de una belleza diferente, digo belleza diferente porque... No, 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 me, no, no, no creo que sean feas. Y, 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 y nace también de, de intentar mostrar eh, a la mujer de otra forma. Yo creo que a la mujer solo se la acepta joven, guapa, delgada, eh, y, y, y se la inutiliza ¿no? cuando, cuando se convierte en adulta. Entonces me, parece, me parecía que era una buena idea de formarlas y, y que fuesen felices un mundo en el que la mujer no tiene tantas obligaciones. Considero que es una película bastante feminista. Yes, and um, therefore I went about uh, trying to create these characters, to shape these characters. First of all, of course, I I looked for uh, actors who had these natural deformities, who had been born with these deformities, so that I could use them. And um, then I turned to some of the actresses that are also well known in Spain, that are uh, well known beauty icons in Spain, such as uh, Ana Polvorosa. And I felt it was really very appealing to me to try to create a different kind of take on them, a, diff a different kind of beauty, because I wouldn't consider this ugly or I wouldn't categorize it that way. And uh, really, through this kind of film, to try and show also a different kind of femininity, if you will, uh, a kind that uh, is a bit different than the iconic sort of young, thin uh, model type, and uh, really to take it somewhere else in this sense. And therefore, I believe that this is a world which shows. Uh, this feminine beauty in a, an entirely different way, and I believe that that is actually a feminist take. Maybe it's also time to watch a clip Tal here and to um, show a little bit of the emotional core of the film because these people are, do not only all have their stories that are intertwined, but there's also sort of like a culmination of um, what the so-called, I'm um, always using the other as so-called other, um, what the other body and the um, able body, um, sort of like how they interact. ¿Estás enamorado de mí o de mi físico? Ahora tú me gustas. Pero te gusto yo. ¿O te gusta mi físico? ¿Me gustas tú? ¿Sabes lo que creo, Ernesto? Que tú no estás enamorado de mí. 
que tú no has tenido una pareja en tu vida porque no te has preocupado de conocer a las mujeres, de entenderlas. En el fondo a ti te daría igual que yo fuera una hija de puta o una buenísima persona. Porque lo único que te importa de mí es mi físico. Y eso es una enfermedad. Las pieles cambian, las pieles se operan, se transforman. La apariencia física no es nada. ¿Quieres comentar lo que acabamos de ver? Eh, sí. Eh, bueno, eh, ella es Candela Peña eh, y él es Secund de la Rosa. Son, son actores impresionantes en, en España. Eh, la idea de esta secuencia era... Eh, es, era, era generar una, contra, una contradicción continua, ¿no? Eh, una, un, un, un hombre que quiere ser eh, diferente al resto y que es diferente al resto y, y ama a, a esa mujer porque es malformada y porque no sigue los cánones estéticos eh, que la sociedad establece y a su vez una mujer eh, malformada que le deja precisamente por eso porque siente que no la quiere por su interior sino que la quiere solamente por su físico. Eh, es una película muy contradictoria porque, eh, porque es, 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 es muy complejo ¿no? eh, el, el, generalizar y, y, y que a todo el mundo le guste lo mismo. Hay muchas, muchas cosas de esta película que yo tampoco sé responder, pero me parecía interesante mostrar la contradicción, la contradicción del físico incluso en, en la propia gente malformada. Y en esta secuencia es donde más claro se ve. Yes, of course. Uh, she is a, a, a Caldera Reina. Candela Peña. Caldera Peña in Segunda de la Rosa is the actor. And um, really, what uh, what is inherent in the scene and that you that you see is the kind of contradictions that uh, take place uh, within the the different characters as well, because he is a man who's trying to be different than others as, as well, because he's attracted uh, to a woman who does not correspond to the kind of norms and standards that you would, or aesthetic standards as well, that you would find in society. And uh, she at the same time rejects him because she feels that he is only attracted to her because of her surface, because of her outer, outward appearance, and not because of her inner being, really, because that is what she really wants him to, to be attracted to. So I've been, I believe that there are quite a few contradictory movements there, if you will, uh, different aspects that uh, you cannot sum up in any way, particular way, because uh, they are, of course, they are, of course, linked to the way of love, to the way of feeling of the uh, individual. And uh, I think that is really what I wanted to uh, include here, uh, to go also beyond the simple uh, physical contradictions that exist. And uh, maybe we can go back to Julie for a second uh, and, and talk a little bit about, um, you've, you've said um, you've made one, one other film, but you, you've made a lot of other arts. I mean, you're a multimedia artist and you've done a lot of uh, installations or maybe environments, I don't know what you call them. And um, I was thinking about the influence of, um, of other art forms also concerning the body in, in the film Fluid Zero. Um, because what we already saw, I mean, it's a very... Um, sort of like drastic um, example of a, a performance also and there's other moments in the film where you have sex scenes in a, in a bed of cabbage for example the, the the lesbian sex scenes are all choreographed very well so maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh, the interrelations of first of all body images performance art your art and then the film how that found um, yeah, its way into the film yeah uh Yes, so it, it, it's interesting. Sometimes I have to separate my artwork from my film work, and so I always kind of travel uh, between the two realms, you know. So I'm, for example, I'm part of the uh, Transmedia Festival that's happening sort of parallel with the Berlin Island. I'm actually doing a, a project next week <laughs> in Berlin, a wedding, um, and it's about mushroom. It's called Mycelium Network Society and uh, trying to network, you know, using mushroom as a, a network medium, um, that kind of thing. So at the same time, in, in film, I feel, you know, I could actually express uh, this kind of nakedness body in a more performed way. Uh, in the media art scene, it has always been quite difficult uh, to stage uh, body performance sometimes. 
Uh, I think for food, as I say, when I had a concept in 2000 and since 2000 uh, until now, I have staged uh, food as a kind of performance, like casting performance. I would do the, the you know, call up uh, people to come and, and in the process of casting them, I make it a, into a public performance. But uh, for, for this particular performance, I got censored uh, three times, uh, one time in uh, in Norway, one time in Montreal, and one time at the Vosbene in Berlin. <laughs> yeah. what, what happened in the performance that you got censored? It was uh, it was just because of the concept, and uh, you know, just to say, even just to say that, well, okay, the I'm doing the casting. I don't particularly ask people come to the past uh, casting to do ejaculation for me to see, but uh, I just say like there will be naked body, and particularly at Vosbene, I, I always remember this quite clear because that was back in 2005, and uh, I was particularly asked that if I could, uh, if there will be um, any hard on uh, during this performance, because if there will be any hard on during the performance, that would endanger the, the theater. Yeah, so um, it's pretty much like uh, 20 minutes. Uh, and I, I have this talk with the, the director, and I say I can't really guarantee uh, there won't be any hard on uh, during the performance. <laughs> I, I think it would be too much for me to make that guarantee. So they shut me down pretty much the, like 20 minutes before the show. So, um, so in a way, it, it's really tricky. You know, of course, like with this film, I can still see. You know, yesterday I saw my Japanese producer who produced IKU, and he loves the film, but immediately he said, "I'm so sorry, the Japanese audience would never see this film because <laughs> because for this film." It, it, it was too much nakedness, I guess. You know, I called it the explicit body part. And uh, so I, I think it's a matter of the, how I juggle, saying like how, in, you know, so sometimes in the hour I don't do sex at all. I, I make this very clear. <laughs> um, but in a certain way, I think I'm always quite interested in technology, particularly the biotechnology and what, Biotechnology means, you know, in terms of it, uh, the the whole intervention into our body, and and that is uh, for me a quite uh, important aspect of my own sort of research in the in the field. Mm. When we talked about hard ons, Eduardo grabbed the mic, so I think he wants to say something. You want to say something? Yeah, dile que sí que que su discurso hace que yo también me empalme. He's saying that actually you're talking about hard-ons has really uh, turned him on. No, quería decir que es curioso el, el, el miedo que se le tiene a la genitalidad y más en concreto a la genitalidad femenina. Eh, ella hablaba de censura y es, y es impresionante. Yo, eh, se, se sigue censurando la genitalidad. Eh, Eat My Shit, el corto, que, el corto que hicimos antes de la película, eh, hablaba sobre una mujer que le censuraban una foto de su cara en Instagram porque tenía un, un ano en la cara. Y cuando yo subí esta foto a mis redes sociales, eh, también la censuraron. Entonces, eh, no sé, me parece, me parece extraña el, el, eh, extraño y reseñable el miedo que se le tiene a, a los sanos, a las pollas, a las tetas y, y al sexo en general. Yes, I find it really, really curious that there is a, a kind of general fear of genitals that seems to abound. It's particularly also female genitals in that sense. Uh, there seems to be, you, you talked about censorship in, in there, and I do believe that that is something that uh, extends very much to genitals in, in general. We had that experience in the short that I did just before doing this film, which was a story of a woman who uh, has an asshole in her face, and she tries, to, uh, she tries to show this picture on Instagram, and it gets pulled. And uh, actually, when I tried to uh, um, load um, or, or um, upload this, uh, this image to my Facebook account, it got <laughs> also censored. So I find that quite strange indeed. There's a kind of general fear, this, uh, you know, be it the sphincter, be it the vagina, be it a uh, hard-on, there seems to be a general fear of showing these things. De hecho, eh, nos, bueno, uno de los motivos por los que conseguimos hacer la película Pieles era porque, por este motivo, por el motivo de que censuraban el cortometraje, eh, se hizo viral porque la gente lo quería ver y, y, y gracias a eso conseguimos un productor. Así que a lo mejor la censura luego no es tan mala. 
So actually, in an ironical twist and, and turn of things, if you will, the fact that Skins was actually shot, that it actually got funded, was down to uh, the experience that we had with the short, because as it was pulled, it was censored, it, it went viral. People wanted to see more of it. They, they, they wanted to see it. They, they, there was a general clamor to see it. And that's how we found a producer. So in the end, you could say that censorship worked re really well for us. The film is online, and I, it's like we staged this, but I have it on my computer also. Maybe we can also watch the first minutes of that, not finish it, because also the main actress is here. And maybe you want to introduce her. Ah, genial. Van a poner el cortometraje? Pues, bueno, nada. Fue impresionante porque yo estaba... Teníamos muy poco dinero, ¿no? Y yo venía de, de, de Cuba, un momento extraño, y rodamos este corto Iciar eh, Castro y, 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 y otra amiga mía. Y lo rodamos con mucha ilusión y, y se acabó haciendo muy grande. O sea, que es una pasada que lo podáis ver, que se haya convertido en película, que esté aquí Iciar. Es una, todo es una maravilla. Yes, it's, uh, it's quite interesting, really, because uh, it, w it came about at a moment where we were low on funds, really. I had just came back from, uh, come back from Cuba. It was a strange moment for me. And then we uh, embarked upon this project together with uh, Isiar Castro and another friend of mine and myself. And we started making this uh, really uh, with great hopes. And then it suddenly turned into this other film as well. So it's all been, uh, you know, a fairy come true. The film is called Eat My Shit, and we're just going to uh, watch maybe the first minute or something. Que me han censurado la foto en Instagram. Yo he subido la foto, pero los 20 minutos he borrado y me ha llegado un mail que decía su foto ha sido eliminada por su carácter sexual. Que era una foto normal, un selfie de mi cara. ¿Cómo que entonces por qué me la han censurado? Pues porque tengo un objeto en la cara. Las personas que tenemos un objeto en la cara no podemos tener Instagram. Es que no es justo, mamá. No me gustaría a mí haber nacido con el objeto donde lo tiene todo el mundo. No se dan cuenta de que... ¿Ya sabes lo que va a comer? Eh, sí, tiene caldo de pollo. Eh, eso no entra en el menú. No, no, no pasa nada, da igual. Cool. Solitario, voy vomitando mi llanto y al verme tan infeliz. Nadie quiere darme un beso porque apesto a este coleo. Y hasta se me caen los mocos y me los como y es penoso no poderlos compartir. Nunca nadie se ha atrevido a darme un poco de cariño. Soy repugnante un cerdo, pero que un puerco. Lo cuento. <risa> Se van a enterar.
actually this this scene almost originally is like this in Gilles, but the shitting is not. Cuando ella de Feca no decidí no no rodarlo en la película porque bueno espero que no sea un spoiler pero eso sale al principio de la película y el personaje todavía no se ha revelado contra la sociedad ni contra el mundo entonces si ella defecaba al principio de la película eh, no, no tenía sentido ¿no? porque su, su revelación cuando ella cuando ella, cuando ella decide luchar contra todos es al final de la película por eso decidí cortarlo luego también me parecía que que el personaje tenía cosas más interesantes que ofrecer y más misterios eh, acerca del personaje que ofrecer que que defecar, por eso decidí quitarlo en la película. Yes, actually the scene where she defecates is not included in Pieles and Skins afterwards and uh, that was a decision that I consciously made actually and I don't I hope this is not a spoiler but uh, actually this is a scene that uh, is included very much at the beginning of Skins and um, it is a moment where she and, and the character that she plays has not yet really rebelled against the, the conditions and society around her so um, I felt that uh, if I had included that at the beginning it would have some would have run uh, counter to that uh, situation in which she finds herself and therefore I decided not to include it um, also I felt that there were other aspects aspects to this character that were perhaps also multifaceted, a bit mysterious as well, that I wanted to explore, and therefore I uh, forwent this, the inclusion of the defecation. Creo que defecar, creo que hacer caca, cagar, es un acto de liberación, y el personaje no se podía liberar todavía, por lo tanto no podía defecar. Well, I believe that defecation is actually an act of liberation, and she hadn't liberated herself, therefore she couldn't defecate in the film, in Skins. Um, thank you. Back to Shu, uh, Shulif, maybe yes, with uh, yes. something that Eduardo said about how difficult it was to produce this film. I also know that um, you had a long history of, like, I think, kickstart producing Fluid Zero, and maybe you can elaborate a little bit about um, how difficult it is to make a film that is pornographic, if you want to, that is queer, and that is very experimental and very sort of art-driven. Um. In, uh, for my previous film that was made in Japan uh, with uh, Uplink, uh, Mr. Takashi Asai-san, uh, at the time he actually pretty much self-funded the film, but for that film it was actually very clear he invited me to come to Japan to make a film and uh, for him it was very clear that he really wanted to challenge the Japanese censorship, you know. Uh, he someone has been Uh, fighting the court in Japan to bring uh, Mapato's book into Japan, for example, so because Japan actually have a very strict law of uh, uh, not being able, e either in book publication or in film, that you cannot show any genitals, you know, uh, vagina and penis included. Um, so, um, uh, That was very clearly, we, we tried to do something, and, and that film was explicit, but really not so much explicit. But at the end, when the, film, the movie was shown in Japan, you know, other than uh, we already blurred the film, and still uh, the, the producer had to go to the film board and black out another 65 spots. And so it was always very sad for me. Of course, by the time I came to Berlin to, to make Fui Zero with uh, the producer Jürgen Bunin, um, he, someone, has started organize a film festival called Ber uh, Porn Film Festival Berlin. And uh, I have known him since uh, when he was still in New York, so I, I know him for some time. However, I think um, when he started the, the Porn Film Festival back in 2006, he actually premiered Uh, I think maybe 2005, he actually uh, showed IKU as an opening film for the festival, and the festival is now in its 11 years. Um, so he does know my work, and he made me also make another performance also with exposed body, you know. So, uh, however, for, for producing Fui Zero, I think uh, we all know from the beginning it's going to be hard to get the funding. Uh, and uh, I don't even try to go through the usual channel to to get the funding. 
Um, but also, I think Yogan has a reputation of able to produce a film very cheaply. <laughs> uh, so he actually can do it. And uh, I think we had this discussion, like I say, well, Yogan, I really want to make this film. And he's like, oh, surely you're too expensive for me. And I say, oh, yeah, you're so cheap. I don't even know how you produce a film for 50,000 euro, you know. But anyway, so after all this struggle, I said, well, I really have to make this film now. I feel the time is right. Um, you know, I, I think another thing um, about the movie is uh, pretty much shot, you know, it's, it's all shot in Berlin using the Berlin resources that the producer was able to gather. We went through three years of casting. Um, the, the main thing is uh, when we start talking about the the body or the other body, you know, I think the film sort of treat a different body quite normally, you know, so we have uh, the cis men and women, we also have uh, trans men and women, but there was really no mention about, you know, what kind of genital difference between these, so you can see a man's face, then, then we pin down to, uh, to the vagina, for example, but it was not being made like a special case in the film. So the producer really allowed me to have the whole freedom uh, to make this film. And uh, of course, maybe now we have to take the consequences about if it can go out to the, to the market. You know? yeah. <laughs> and um, maybe let's talk a little bit about um, if you were influenced by theory, I was just wondering, there's this very, very famous in feminist history, this uh, cyborg manifesto by Donna Haraway, which was back then a very um, sort of like aggressive attack on essentialist feminism and sort of like very radical in bringing the idea of a non-human part into some kind of like gender order. And I wonder if you, if you were influenced by that or if, if the cyborgs that you actually create um, are, are cyborgs that are represent a new kind of feminism or even like, I mean Donna Haraway is not new but like if they if that's sort of like meant as an intervention in a queer feminist uh, discourse uh, of course uh, I, I actually have another project called Brandon which is a website and was commissioned by the Guggenheim Museum and that was a project done in 1998-1999 which I kind of transport a, a transgender person actually uh, Brandon Tina onto the web and, and sort of have the voyage on the web for one year. Um, so that was done like the late 90s and of course it was very influenced by the whole cyborg uh, uh, manifesto. Just and quickly to say that Brent and Tina, everyone knows I think the transgender person that was murdered in the US in the, yeah. in the hate crime and that uh, Kimberly Pierce made this film Boys Don't Cry Out. Yeah. Um, so I think for me the in the 90s, you know, with uh, Cyber Feminist uh, Manifesto and also my own uh, obsession with apparatus and the trans apparatus, particularly uh, the sort of you, you, you do have different kind of packing for trans, per, trans men and, uh, you know, the, the whole discussion between trans men and women, the, uh, the, the kind of passing cross over, you know, I think everybody was doing passing like, you know, once you have the surgery or not have the surgery, uh, you want to become on the other side. You want to be men if you are a trans, trans man. If you want to be a woman, you are a trans woman. So this for me is a very 90s and I, w I was also quite obsessed with these uh, sort of body parts, you know. So IKU is actually come out from that particular cyborg uh, theory because uh, IKU is really more about the body and machine interface, you know, so the body is made out of the hard drive and uh, the orgasm is just the data collected by a body hard drive. Um, I think fluids, by the time I got into fluids, uh, everything become very organic, <laughs> you know, so the body fluids is really more of you know, and um, uh, there is still the the biotechnology intervention, but the intervention actually come in uh, via the fluid, via the data, via the skin contact, via the insertion of the data, the codes into the body directly. So I totally uh, sort of uh, get rid of the whole hardware, the hard drive, you know. So in the film you saw the, the replicant, um, their hand become like a, 
iris scan machine, so everything kind of built into the body, you know. So as you say, um, I do have a, quite a lot of dildo at the end of the film, but again, all these is kind of, um, uh, it, it, it's still a lot about simulation, the cause, you know, but it, I think we, we sort of have to um, treat the body in a, in, but mainly because I, I'm dealing a lot with the corporation, you know, I think for me it's still a kind of resistance uh, of the, the corporate intervention into our bodies, the biotechnology, the whole agriculture industry, the, the gene, you know, the genetic uh, modification, all, all these kind of issues at the end is all involved in the fluid. So it's very different from, I would say, uh, the cyborg. But at the same time, I think Donna Holloway also advanced into the whole biotechnology in her recent writings. So, yeah. I want to <laughs> ask a, a question that I also Una asked you because I think it also applies to you and that is that of the performance. Your entire film is like very accurately um, choreographed uh, but also um, uh, ausgestattet uh, and uh, designed and um, lit opera in a sense, which makes it even more surreal with the characters that you're creating and maybe you can tell us also a little bit about the idea of that something other than film is reaching out of that film that you maybe, you know, link it to, I would say, an opera also to a performance, also maybe to music video aesthetics and stuff like that. <coughs> Mi idea con pieles era conseguir crear imágenes que, que, que fuesen muy, muy estetas, que fuesen muy, muy, impactat, muy impactantes y que, y que solamente con la estética consiguiesen llegar eh, y consiguiesen contar exactamente lo que yo, lo que yo quería contar. Porque eh, a mí siempre me ha pasado algo y es que eh, en realidad yo detesto la estética, odio la estética y odio el color rosa porque me parece que la estética eh, y, que la, y que la imagen es es un monstruo muy peligroso que, que si tú no lo, no lo controlas, acaba comiéndose la historia. Para mí, en pieles, el trabajo más complicado era eh, medir entre, entre la, la, la estética, la imagen, lo, lo, lo más impactante, ¿no? lo más surrealista, pero intentar que ese, que ese poder estético no se comiese una historia que hay debajo, que al fin y al cabo es una historia sobre, sobre ser uno mismo, sobre ser libre. Y me parecía que darle más importancia a la estética que a la historia Era, era frivolizar un tema que para mí es muy serio y, y, y bueno, ¿no? ahí estaba el trabajo de, de, de ponderar, de, de medir y de, y de que una cosa no se comiese a la otra. Yes, well, I thought that um, when I started thinking about uh, Pieles and, and setting up the concept of Pieles, um, I really wanted to have these very, very aesthetic images, uh, supercharged Im images that would be extremely striking as well. Um, because I think thought felt that uh, in, by using this aesthetic, I could um, use these images that could uh, tell the story that I really wanted to relate. Um, Actually, I have to stress that I hate sort of uh, aesthetics and, and the color uh, rose, really, um, because I, I very often I have the impression that uh, when things are too aesthetic, uh, that they tend to uh, devour the story, really, the, to smother the story. And therefore, in this case, what I wanted to achieve was to have these very, very striking images, but at the same time ensure that they do not smother the story, which is the story beneath this, which is a story about uh, being oneself, uh, uh, about uh, liberation, about uh, coming into one's own, really. And I wanted to avoid that uh, the aesthetic might uh, come across in any way as being uh, flippant or frivolous there. And so it was about striking a very delicate balance. Y en, yo siempre que digo ¿no? que yo odio el rosa, la gente me mira raro porque dice, tu casa es rosa, la gente, es, mi, mi casa es entera completamente rosa, mi ropa es rosa, ¿no? mi, mis trabajos son rosas, pero yo solamente utilizo el rosa porque es una obsesión para mí, igual que hablo continuamente de, 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 del género, del físico, de las madres y del rosa, no es porque me guste, es porque me obsesiona y mmm, yo trabajo desde la obsesión, es solo por eso. 
And um, I always say that I hate rose, and people look at me askance and say, what? I mean, your house is decorated in rose colors. You know, you know the, the, the clothes that I wear are all rose colored, and, and even my work has this uh, color filter. So, uh, But I have to say it's an obsession for me. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's the same kind of obsession as, it, as is gender, as is the physical appearance, and mothers as well. And rose is a, a kind of obsession for me, and I think I, that's the starting point for my work. That's what triggers my work. Want to ask you a question about the happy ending. Y sobre el final, uh, alegre, it's a, yeah, it's a very beautiful happy ending. It's also a spoiler alert for everyone. <laughs> no, pasa, no, pasa que, que, no pasa nada. Ella, ella puede hacer spoiler porque es maravillosa. A ella se lo permitimos. Well, you're allowed to, do, to provide a spoiler here because you're beautiful and therefore you have the allowances explicitly <laughs> to do so. Mira, eh, creo que es un final feliz y creo que tiene que ser un final feliz porque yo creo que mm, el mundo es un lugar eh, horrible y precioso a partes iguales y creo que, que los diferentes, que los deformes, que, 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 que todas las minorías siempre encontramos nuestro lugar. Me parecería muy injusto hacer una película sobre gente outsider, sobre gente loser, sobre freaks, y que no encontrasen su lugar, porque yo me he sentido un outsider, un freak, y, y he encontrado mi lugar, y estoy aquí sentado, hablando con gente maravillosa que me entiende, lo cual no podría ser de otra forma. Me parecería injusto. Yes, but um, I think that uh, that is really the point. I, it had to be a happy ending. It couldn't be otherwise because I really believe that we live in a world where sort of the horrible aspects and the beautiful aspects are exist in, in more or less in the same parts as well. They share this world. And uh, I think that there's always a place also for those who are different, for those people who have deformities, for example, and for minorities. And it's always the possibility for them to find their place because otherwise it would simply be uh, unjust. It would be unfair. I didn't want to make a film about people who are left outside in the cold, who are freaks. Uh, that was not my film because I myself also feel sometimes that I'm a freak. And, um, but I have found my place. I'm here in this wonderful place speaking to people people who speak my language who understand me and that's wonderful otherwise it would be simply unfair también también me gustaría decir respecto al final que que sí es verdad que todos encuentran su lugar eh, y es y es y eso es mm, bueno no y bonito para ellos porque es lo que quieren pero sí es verdad que ellos encuentran la felicidad y la libertad en sitios extraños es como agridulce como la comida china Yes, but uh, even though it's true that everyone finds their place, their respective place uh, where they can be, um, it is also true that they find it in places which uh, seem strange as well. So there is kind of a bittersweet taste to it. It's almost like Chinese food. I really love the happy ending. A mí me encanta el final feliz. I want to do a little intervention here because um, to put all these under the umbrella of freak as someone who you've been an actor for a long time, um, who's very able-bodied, who's very beautiful. Um, I wonder what um, the reactions were if you, for example, in your photographic work, um, put yourself in a room and one of those was a rooms together with um, sort of like small actresses that I would associate with a freak in a certain kind of like aesthetic or photographic sense and yourself um, being pretty much uh, a model. Don't take that as an offensive attack on yourself, but I think this is a contradiction we should talk about. Sí, bueno, claro que hay una contradicción, pero porque yo creo que el, que el ser un freak no tiene que ver con el físico. Yo creo que el físico no es nada. Eh, yo creo que, el, que, que, que mi parte más freak y mi parte más rara es absolutamente interna. Eh, y, y es realmente la que hace que tú eh, te cueste relacionarte con la gente o no. Porque, porque de eso se trata. Es, Yes, but um, indeed, uh, but I don't see that contradiction really because I think that uh, the, 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 the freakiness, if you will, or is not in the physical. Um, uh, that is not what it is about. I don't believe in, uh, that the physical is that important at all. I think that, it, that is something that, like an inner quality much more that you carry in yourself. And, uh, and that is really what uh, makes it difficult also to uh, enter into a relationship with others. And uh, therefore, I don't believe that it is physical at all. What were the was it the world premiere here in Berlin or was it from Yes, on Saturday. Okay. 
I was, um, wh what were the reactions like by the audience? I, I kind of had it in, in the back of my head that the film was already screened in Spain. No, 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 no. La primera vez, la primera vez que se ha visto es aquí. Es curioso, las reacciones, eh, las reacciones son, yo, yo no me las esperaba, ¿no? Porque la gente eh, tiende a, a, a tener una risa nerviosa cuando está viendo la película porque no saben cómo, cómo comportarse. Eh, lo más bonito que me han dicho viendo la película es eh, que hay cosas horribles en la película que te generan, que te generan risa o amor, ¿no? Me, me dijo el otro día una señora, eh, nunca pensé que me emocionaría con un beso negro y me parece que, 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 es, que, está, que, es, que es genial ¿no? que, que se puedan emocionar con un beso negro. Yes, uh, well, actually, um, uh, it's not true that it was shown in Spain previously, so it had a, its world premiere indeed here in Berlin. And reactions, well, on the whole, I can say that they were also, there were also unexpected reactions uh, within this. Uh, on the whole, it's, it's true that you, people tend to uh, laugh nervously about it when they see the film, uh, but there are also uh, beautiful reactions, and one of the most beautiful reactions that I heard was uh, um, somebody who told me, well, there are horrible things here in this film that make you laugh and 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 uh, but also make you fall in love with them and I never thought that I would be able uh, to laugh also about a, a black kiss uh, kissing an asshole and uh, so that uh, that I thought was I thought that was a, a wonderful reaction I would really loved it Para mí lo más importante y lo que me emociona de verdad es que la gente el público eh, eh, está viendo la película lo que de lo que se habla realmente, que es algo bastante esperanzador, es un canto a la libertad y el canto a ser uno mismo, ¿no? Y, y toda la parte estética, toda la parte de las malformaciones, pasa a un segundo plano cuando, cuando empiezan a ver eh, un, un mensaje real. Eh... And uh, what really, what, what, what I find so immediate, very emotional, was, was something that's very emotional for me is to see that the, the public, the audience that sees these films actually sees what it, this, 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 the film speaks to, what, it's, what it is really about, which is really much, uh, much more about the liberation and coming into your own being yourself. And um, so the aesthetics at some point actually in this reaction uh, take the back seat and they're no, not so dominant anymore. Julie, how was it with your Julie? world premiere? That is a, a day, a day. Yesterday, last night, actually, yesterday. also world premiere in Berlin. I, I really have to say, you know, for me, I always think when the film uh, was shot in Berlin, produced in Berlin, I think Berlin now is the perfect uh, place to do the premiere. Um, and it's true, and I think the this festival, particularly this festival, the audience have seen so many different films, you know, over the past, there is a whole history to accept the queer films and uh, it was just perfect. So the, the first question uh, after the screening, actually someone said, thank you for making such a movie that is unapologetically, you know, and I think that was a, a best word you can say because you know, I think in, in a way the film like resentlessly keeps showing body fluid in different forms and that is a kind of insistence uh, on the liberation of the fluid. Uh, but it, it is, you know, like you talk about people laughing at uh, kissing an asshole. I have people laughing at the pissing, so. <laughs> um, are there audience questions actually? Let me just add a, a, a very uh, quick <laughs> remark. Um, because uh, when I asked the question about the, the happy ending or Eduardo's film, and I was thinking about my own film that kind of swing between being considered or conceived as uh, either utopia or dystopia. And it seems like, you know, in my artwork or in my film that I keep, um, some people would describe it as a utopia and some people would say this is a totally dystopia view. Uh, and one time I got, you know, I, I make a proposal uh, to show this concept in Vienna, but then there was debate, they say, oh, but the show is utopia, but your concept is very dystopia. But Miche actually, when we had a discussion about this film, he think this film is utopia. So <laughs> I, I just want to say, like, because for me, it's like when we talk about having a happy ending, you know, like for me, it's the 
uh, also the, the kind of uplifting experience that, that we want uh, to convey in the film, and I think that's important. So maybe at the end it is utopia. Do you think your film is utopia or dystopia? <laughs> Yo pienso que eh, seguramente para la gente que ve la película eh, piense que es una distopía porque el lugar que eligen los personajes para ser felices puede ser horrible porque en un caso es la muerte, en otro caso es la amputación, en otro caso es la soledad. Pero es, creo que puede ser una distopía para la gente que la ve, pero sin embargo lo importante es que, que para ellos es una utopía porque es el, es el mejor sitio donde ellos podrían estar. Eh, creo que el, el lugar perfecto es el lugar que uno considera perfecto, eh, por muy extraño que sea. Yes, I'm pretty sure that people who go to see the film, the audience will uh, identify it or see it as a dystopian uh, vision because uh, the places that these characters choose in order to come into their own and be themselves in order to be happy are uh, rather horrible places, you know, uh, at least uh, along common understanding or lines of common understanding because one is death, the other one, cho one chooses amputation and uh, the third one uh, chooses isolation. But uh, I think the utopian element is really attached to the characters themselves because they choose these these places. Those are the best places for them. And in that sense, it is utopian um, because I think uh, there is no such thing as the perfect place. It is the place that you feel is perfect for yourself. That is really uh, the perfect place. And uh, even though others might feel that it is a completely strange choice. I was just, I was just thinking about, um, I don't know if you know, uh, uh, Linda Williams, she's I think one of the first like feminists who wrote like a lengthy book about, like a sex book, book about pornography and she puts Uh, the genre of pornography um, together with the genre of melodrama and the genre of horror because of uh, all genres do something with your body that something comes out of your body and I found this really interesting and now I'm thinking about this because it applies to well there's no shitting involved but a horror film can make you like physically the physical reaction can be that it makes you so sick that you throw up uh, porn can make you ejaculate And then melodrama uh, is, is, is the one where that is sort of like designed to make the tears come out. So I don't really have a question for that. I don't, I don't think that you built your film around that theory, but I was just th thinking about actually your theory about, about the liberation of shitting and then yours um, as a, the liberation of also expelling like all sorts of fluids and how that could be sort of like a theory of itself with, with piss and cum and uh, female ejaculate and everything. Yeah. Do you want to comment on that? Or <laughs> I think we opened for the Yeah, well, I did already. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there Sorry, is a question. Yeah. Do we have an external mic? or? I have a question for Eduardo. Um, when I watched Pieles, I had the impression that like really many people were laughing at well, disabled people, and that made me really uncomfortable. La verdad es que si eso es así, a mí también me haría sentir bastante incómodo y, y triste. Eh, porque, por supuesto, Pieles no pretende eso en ningún momento. Eh, yo he intentado hacer un ejercicio real de intentar justificar y no juzgar a ningún personaje. Eh, incluso a los que pueden ser malos, incluso al al personaje del, del, del pedrasta, he intentado, eh, intentado profundizar en, en lo que le pasaba a él y, y en todos los personajes. No hay ninguna intención de reírse de ellos ni de juzgarlos, solamente de amarlos, yo los amo. Eh, pero de eso se trata, yo creo que todavía, todavía hay muchísima discriminación hacia el diferente y no, no sé, en cualquier caso me gustaría pensar que, que se reían por otra cosa y no por eso, porque me pondría muy triste. Yes, that's very true. I think that uh, would make me would make me feel very uncomfortable as well. Indeed, it would make me feel very very sad if that were uh, the case, because uh, Pieles Skins is a film that does not aim to provoke exactly that kind of reaction. I think uh, the, the the aim that I had for for this film, uh, the out, the exercise that I embarked on, was really not to judge anyone, none of the characters, including those who are actually 
bad characters, if you will, such as uh, the pedophile. I simply try to get into their skin in a way I try to understand them and not judge them. I try to really work out their characters, and in the end, it's about loving them as well. I try to love them, uh, but that's really what it is. I, th I think that there's too much discrimination going on uh, regarding what is different, and um, I really would hope that uh, uh, people really laughed because of other things and not because of uh, the, um, people being uh, handicapped or any way. Are there more questions or comments from the audience? Yes. Hola Eduardo, enhorabuena por la película. Gracias. ¿Los personajes tuvieron algún asesoramiento psicológico antes de hacer la película para aceptarse después de de verla? ¿Los actores? Sí. Yes, first of all, was there any psychological counseling uh, for the actors before they embark on this project in order to be able to accept uh, the roles that they were uh, uh, committing to? Um, la, la verdad es que no, eh, no, lo único que pasó es que acabaron odiándome y, y haciéndome que les pagase um, tratamientos faciales porque su cara estaba completamente destruida. Era Madrid, 40 grados a la sombra y kilos y kilos de silicona en la cara. Um, fue muy complicado, fue muy complicado para los actores. Uh, ahora te voy a decir por qué, pero quiero que te que traduzca esto para que no sea muy largo. Yes, uh, well, uh, the truth is, um, no, we didn't have that kind of counseling. Um, and actually, the actors ha uh, ended up really hating me for what I did to them because uh, I made them wear lots of mascara, lots of silicone in the face in Madrid, 40 degrees Celsius outside. You can imagine what that did to their face. So uh, they made me pay actual uh, for uh, facial reconstruction afterwards. But I'll try to explain a bit more now. For example, the personaje de Ana Polvorosa, Samantha, tenía cuatro horas de maquillaje y no podía comer durante todo el rodaje, lo cual eh, estaba desfallecida, se caía, se caía de sueño, no tenía ningún tipo de energía, no podía comer nada. O el personaje de Laura, Macarena Gómez, eh, ella empezaban a maquillarla a las 5 de la mañana, que era de noche, le tapaban los ojos, rodaba todo el día sin ver nada y cuando se lo quitaban eh, seguía siendo de noche. Entonces durante todo el rodaje vivió de noche. Eh, Candela Peña solo tenía un ojo para interpretar o, por ejemplo, John Cortajarena, que es uno de los hombres más guapos del mundo. Eh, a John, John, Le John Cortajarena es uno de los hombres más guapos del mundo y le quitamos la belleza y él se sentía tremendamente inseguro. Creo que, creo que era un trabajo duro, pero también interesante para los actores, aunque me odien ahora. Yes, um, I think uh, it was very complex. For example, Ana Polvorosa, um, whom you see in this uh, film, it took uh, four hours uh, to uh, prepare her so that uh, we could start shooting. And during uh, the entire uh, photography, during the shooting, she couldn't eat anything. So she was really low on energy. She was falling asleep. She was tripping over. So it was very, very tough on her. Macarena Grana, Grande. Gomez. Gomez, Macarena Gomez, for example, we started um, uh, making up or uh, preparing her at five o'clock in the morning, so it was still dark at then. Then we uh, sort of worked throughout the day, and she only uh, the, the blindfolds were only taken off in the evening when it was night again, so she didn't see any daylight during uh, the shooting at all. Um, and uh, uh, Candela Peña was the same thing. She, she only had one eye, really, so that that was very very difficult. And 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 Juan. Uh, Joan Cortajarena. Joan Cortajarena, who is really uh, 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 an extremely beautiful man, really a very attractive man. We made him look uh, completely uh, ugly in that sense, and it was very, very tough on him as, at the same time to have to undergo this transformation. So uh, I believe, uh, to me, it was a hugely rewarding, interesting experience. The actors might hate me for this, but I think it was the right thing. You make me famous. <laughs> Are there any more questions or comments? If not, I already see Travis Matthews there, who is on the next panel. Yeah, I think it's... Um, I want to thank the Panorama, the Teddy L'Oreal, and um, this location, the Brawl Brow House, Brew House, um, for hosting us. Um, please stay, stick around for Silence, Violence, Queer Narratives in the United States of Oppression with Travis Matthews and Yancy Ford. But for now, Eduardo Casanova, thank you so much for being thank here. Thank you so much. Julie Chang, thank you so much for being here. The films are all repeated, you can still see them. And yeah, thank you very much for that very fruitful discussion. <laughs>